the same opportunity. Okay, I'm sure most people will join. Well, why don't we start? So welcome everybody today. It's my pleasure to introduce Jay Badacharya. Jay is a professor of medicine at Stanford University. He's a research associate at the NBER, senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and at the Stanford Freeman Public Institute. He directs the Stanford Center on the Democracy of the Agent. Agent. Uh, his research focuses on the economics of healthcare around the world, with a particular emphasis on the health and well being of vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Dr. Bacharya's peer reviewed research has been published in economic statistics, legal, medical, public health, and health policy journals, and he holds an MBA and PhD in economics from Stanford University. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for coming, everybody, and welcome. Uh, so I, this is the longest title for a talk I've ever given, but I figured I would just have the short version of exactly what I'm saying in the title so you can see it. Uh, the, and it's it's actually a shocking assertion. that I'm, What I'm saying is that the U.S. government uh, violated the First Amendment rights of, uh, of, of people so that it could protect itself from criticism of outside, by outside scientists of the policies it followed during COVID. Uh, and uh, I know that because I'm mostly going to work, going to be reporting on is the findings from a lawsuit that I'm involved with called the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit brought by the Missouri and Louisiana Attorney General's office against uh, against the Biden administration. And I'm going to show you uh, a lot of the details that have come out of the absolutely shocking details that have come out of that the discovery in that lawsuit. And, uh, you know, you, you know, my opinion, but I think you can make up you'll, you make up your own mind. Um, but I, I wanted to just make sure everyone is on the same page to, to get a sense substantively of what exactly the government wanted suppressed. So I'm going to start with a, a document called the Great Barrington Declaration. Many of you in the room uh, have probably heard of this already, but so if, if I bore you, please don't you know, just forgive me. But I'll, I'll, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go backwards in time just a little, just to set the stage. Uh, so the Great Barrington Declaration was a document that I wrote with uh, Martin Kulder, who's there on the left, and Sunetra Gupta in the middle. Martin was a, uh, is a professor at Harvard University in biostatistics. Um, he developed the, the vaccine safety surveillance, like the statistical infrastructure underlying the vaccine safety surveillance systems the FDA uses. Uh, Sunetra Gupta, she's a professor of theoretical epidemiology at Oxford University. And she, uh, uh, her, her most recent project is developing a universal flu vaccine, like the, the mathematics of, of a universal flu vaccine. How do you, how do you make it so that, the, that that you can better predict what the next variant of the flu is? How do you find uh, a target in the flu, uh, so, a sort of a genome, so that you have, uh, you don't need to have an updated flu every year? That's that's her research. Uh, and uh, we we met in October of 2020 with the goal of. Uh, of, of uh, essentially talk, talking to each other about what the right strategy for the COVID pandemic should be in, in Western Massachusetts in the town called Great Barrington. Um, and uh, we, we, the, the argument, we basically reached the same conclusion that the lockdown policies that we've been following have been tremendously devastating to the poor, the working class, the children around the world, that that was ineffective in actually stopping the disease from spreading, that, that, that in fact, we had no technology to stop the disease from spreading. Um, and that, uh, that, that, that there was an alternate strategy available, a strategy of focused protection of vulnerable older people that would have better protected the most, most vulnerable people, people who are most vulnerable to being infected with COVID. Um, and so two, two planks, focused protection of vulnerable older people, lifting lockdowns. Those were the two planks. It was a, it's a short one-page document. I uh, hope somebody signed it. Um, and it, it's, a, in fact, almost a million regular people signed it, tens of thousands of doctors, uh, medical professionals, uh, as, as well as epidemiologists and other other folks, signed it. Uh, okay, uh, you know, better protection of older, high risk people. Young adults live near normal lives, right? So I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time justifying the Great Declaration. I just wanted to let you know that it exists and that that it was an alternate strategy that many, 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 many scientists agreed with, including uh, you know Nobel Prize winner here at this uh, in, in, in biophysics here at Stanford. Uh, is, uh, and, and you know, some prominent scientists worldwide. Uh, the the point of this is to let to say that in October 2020, it was there was not a scientific consensus in favor of lockdown. In fact, there was a good, vigorous debate and discussion going on among scientists about the wisdom of lockdown. Uh, I, I can also defend it if you like, but that that's very probably a different a different time. Uh, Okay, uh, I, I can't resist. I have to defend it. Just, just, just two slides, please forgive me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna defend it for two slides. Um, 
Uh, if you want to look, for instance, at all cause excess deaths through the pandemic, excess deaths is what were the death rates before the start of the pandemic by age, then then uh, then weighed up so to a, a base population here, the U.S. population in, in 2000, um, and ask what happened to cumulative mortality in different countries relative to their own trend in mortality oh, before the pandemic. Today, you know, the Swedes are different. They are so, they are so no, different. No, you can't compare them to those perfect people. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, but we help, I mean, Jonathan, I'll grant you that. Uh, but the, but the, uh, I'll tell you what, though, because the Swedes are different people, and somehow they've managed to magically have almost no excess deaths through the whole pandemic, despite having no lockdowns, despite having no masks, uh, mask, forced masking, despite no mandated vaccines, there's high uptake of vaccines, but no mandated vaccines, um, despite having open schools. So they, they followed a very different policy than a lot of the United States. But you were right, Jonathan, I agree with you that it's, you know, it's totally unfair to compare Sweden to the United States. <laughs> so let's compare two other societies, one, one filled with angels, one filled with devils, uh, Florida and California. Oh. And I'll, no, no. I'll leave to you who's filled with angels and who's filled with devils, but like, let's just see what happened through the pandemic. Uh, Florida kept its schools open through most of the pan through most of the pandemic. In fact, I was involved with a legal case in Florida where the, the uh, teachers union sued the state in order to keep the schools closed in 2020. We eventually won that case uh, and the school stayed open. No forced, uh, no, no, no forced uh, masking, no, you know, sort of much lighter touch. Um, and this is cumulative, all cause excess death, a standardized, you know, California has a, a younger population for us, so you have to a standardized. Uh, what you see is that Florida did better at protecting human life through the pandemic than California did. I mean, okay, I, I, I couldn't help it. I had, to, I had to like defend it a little bit, but that's that's the end of my defense. I, I, we'll, we could have another seminar next time about about more of a defense of, of why the great branding approach was the right strategy. Um, okay, the, the topic of today though is not that. The topic of today is what was the reaction of the, the US federal government to the fact that there were a tremendous number of scientists who disagreed with the, the, the prescription put forward by people like Tony Fauci. Uh, and uh, so, fringe uh, epidemiology is, is the title. Uh, let me show you what that why, why I say that. Uh, the, this is Francis Collins. He's the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Texas, uh, the, the National, National Institute of Health, the Institute of Health. Uh, the, he's the boss of Tony Fauci, who's the uh, head of National uh, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Um, uh, this is this email is from uh, was dis discovered via a FOIA request by uh, by a uh, by a, a journalist about a year after he wrote it, and it's it's an email from four days after we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration. October 4, twenty twenty, was the date of the declaration. October eighth, twenty twenty, is the date of this email. Uh, in that time, we put up a, a web page that had gone in. Viral. There was starting to be some um, some uh, uh, you know press around the Great Barrington Declaration, and uh, it came to the attention of the head of the National Institute. Of just just to set, uh, set the stage, that the the uh, Francis Collins is at the head of the National Institute of Health. He sits on top of you know forty five billion dollars of funding uh, that funds basically every single biomedical scientist who's built in the United States, and also. Uh, you know, many, many prominent biomedical scientists outside the United States. Uh, I have tenure in the medical school. One of the major reasons I have tenure is because I was successful in getting NIH grants. It's a, it's a, it's a major, you know, notch in your belt. So it's not just he controls funding, he controls the careers, the futures of biomedical scientists in this country. So when he speaks, and he's, and, and I'm about to read this email to you, you can see it in, in your, in your, uh, see it in front of you. Uh, when he speaks, it has a tremendous effect. When he and, it, and it's not just, by the way, in private he spoke. He gave interviews to newspapers, prominent ones like the Washington Post, where he reiterated points very, very close to this word. Uh, John. I, it's for your next project, but the, the Nobel Prize winner for the mRNA vaccine for Penn, I'm sorry, I forget her name. It was okay. a shocking story because she couldn't get grants and as a result, could not get a job. And so right now, it's not just a question of, can you get money? It's, can you actually work at all is dependent entirely on the federal government's ability and willingness. Yeah, to uh, that story of Catherine McCarthy was really, really interesting, right? She, she was denied tenure at Penn. 
Uh, How much you couldn't get grants? Because you couldn't get grants. So this this federal yeah, grants. From uh, the federal grants. Sorry, and sorry. it's not just enough to get grants. Like you can't just get grants from some Yahoo organization. It really it's the NIH. This is a small number of organizations that determine whether you can work in <laughs> social status in in in, in medicine environments. The other thing about this that worries me is you happen to have been right. But it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, it should, it should, we should be we should be funding even more. It helps. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> I know. It, it would be okay, there are a lot of people that need to bring out this before, and they still should get NIH funding. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I. So this is this is not talking another time. This is something actually I worked on before the pandemic. I think the NIH has been entirely too conservative in its funding portfolio. It's taken too few risks relative to what it ought to have taken. Uh, and in particular, part of the thing is uh, it's funded very very large projects. That uh, at the expense of smaller projects by younger, younger, younger scientists, and, and, I, and it's not surprising given uh, Francis Collins' history. Francis Collins came to fame because he was head of the Human Genome Project, the, la the largest, the single largest project ever, I think, conducted by the NIH, which was certainly among them. Um, and it brought a tremendous number of scientists together on one task, and sort of squeezed out a whole bunch of other younger. Uh, younger scientists maybe want, had different priorities for how scientific scientific uh, effort should have been, been put. So he has a, a bias toward uh, funding older established scientists on very very large projects. So sort of an sort of establishment bias. Um, so how do you react to the Great Barrington Report? So let me read it. Um, uh, so this is to Tony Fauci and to Cliff Lane. Cliff Lane is is Tony Fauci's aide. A long time lead. Uh, hi, Tony and Cliff, cgbdeclaration.org. That's, that's the website we put up that attracted almost a million people uh, almost uh, you know, almost immediately after we put it up. Not, and just remember, this is four days after we wrote it. This proposal from the three fringe epidemiologists, that's me, Martin Sinatra. That's, by the way, why I went through Martin and Sinatra's uh, long CV, because I wanted to make sure you knew they're not actually fringe epidemiologists, right? Harvard, Oxford, designing the FDA's a uh, statistical safety surveillance system. Yeah, it's the statistics of the safety surveillance systems. Um, you know, uh, very, very, very prominent epidemiologists and biostatisticians and, and so on, who met with the secretary. That's Secretary Azar. So a couple of days after we wrote the fifth declaration, uh, the uh, uh, the secretary Azar of, of HHS met, met with us, where we told him to open schools and better protect vulnerable older people, like just the substance of the declaration. Um, seems to be getting a lot of attention, and even a co-signature from Nobel Prize winner Mike Levitt at Sam. There needs to be a quick and devastating published takedown of its premises. I don't see anything like that online yet. Is it underway? So what happened next was that I, I started getting um, uh, emails from, um, from, uh, uh, from, from, from people saying, why did I want to kill so many people? There were, there were hit pieces in the Washington Post and the New York Times with Francis Collins and Tony, Tony Fauci quoted, accusing me of, of wanting to let the virus rip. Those words do not appear in the Great Barrington Declaration. They never occurred to me until I read them in the newspaper in the mouth of Tony Fauci. It was an organized propaganda campaign to smear anyone who might have thought the heretical thoughts that were expressed in the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was, they linked it very directly to a political uh, campaign that was going on at the time. The declaration, 40, uh, but people from 40 different countries sent us translations of the declaration. It was, a, it was, it was aimed at the rest of, uh, most of, you know, primarily at like you know, poor countries. Because what we saw had happened in the spring lockdown to, to poor, the poorest people in the poorest countries was just devastatingly awful. And we saw that the lockdowns were coming back. We were not writing this as a political document, John. Thank you, everyone. Put it back a little. If we had the ghost of Tony Fauci here, suppose this were a um, a disease that killed ten percent of the people it got, and suppose that the interventions actually could slow the spread because they could bring the reproduction rate under one rather than six to five. Then, in fact, they might have had a point. The Barrington approach might have killed more people. So, um, right. So they were they were wrong on some very elementary facts, but not entirely wrong on, on the logic that this could kill people. Right. They, they, had, they had a particular view of the data. Uh, of course, I disagreed with both of those, those, those ideas, yeah. right? Uh, and, 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 and specifically, the second one is the most important. Right? Are these interventions actually effective? Do they, do they, do they have costs that are worth paying 
in order to gain effectiveness, right? That was the, that was the debate I wanted to have. Another debate I wanted to have was uh, how do we better protect older people when in fact the lockdowns are not able to do that, right? But I, I mean, and I, he's making an assumption there that I would need some of the evidence for, that even if it did kill 10% of the population, a lockdown, you know, if both. you believe those both. two you things, believe both of those then their ones. response has some logic to it. Has some logic to it, yes, yeah. but it's still not necessarily the right. If response. you believe those two things, yeah, obviously. But if right. those two things, my worry is, is this: this latest thing is a, is a bit of a junk. But then say we have something that's not a bit of a junk, something that does kill ten percent. Well, there is. What is the best response? Right. So, okay, okay, right. You, have have, you have to have both of those items, John. Right. In order to yeah. Yeah, right. so yeah. you can't have what, just one. You need so to, if it's just ten, if it's just ten percent, that's not enough. No, wait, I agree. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Then it's even well, the grand I'd grand. like to know what the best response is. It's Correct. not fucking obvious. It doesn't have to be a lockdown. Yeah. But there may be a better response. Like, what if there's a huge age gradient or some other risk factor that's exactly. like where you can identify, yeah. even with a very, very high yeah, yeah, yeah. rate, even though the lockdowns may work in some nominal sense, then maybe you get a better response. That we, we should have this discussion. And the, right? and the other thing is like the inclusive X's might work. You know? yes. <laughs> the other discussion right. is the human incentive elements. The reason Fauci didn't want to, want to do because he wanted to be a hero. That yeah. a lot of doctors have this. They want to treat because they want to be a hero. Yeah. So anybody you put in charge is going to have that incentive. I, I mean, he's such a complicated character. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to What's try to version? version. Michael, yeah. 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 I don't think Trump wanted to be a hero, or he certainly didn't know how to be one. We're here about the ability to censor the knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You guys, I still haven't got the Missouri survival. Let's let's keep going. So let me not not only just tell you, Jay. Jay, can I ask you something, David Henderson here? Oh, hey, David. Make it not ask you as much as make a point. Let's say he thought it was ten percent, ten percent death. That wouldn't say, because that's what he thinks, not what he knows. That wouldn't say, let's refute him. It would say, let's examine his thinking. Yes. Yeah. Right? That's a very big difference. Yeah. Right. It's, it doesn't justify, even 10% doesn't justify quick and devastating de takedown. It doesn't justify right. Right. Ad, hom ad, hom ad hominem attack. In fact, Tony Fauci responded to this email the day later with a Wired magazine article. Essentially saying, let it, let it rip all the smears. And I started getting death threats, by the way, right around this. Like I started getting uh, vicious attacks online, uh, racist things like, you know, go go back to your home country, uh, get COVID and die, you know, that, that kind of thing. It was, it was It's the kind of thing that poisons the debate. It's not the kind of thing that leads to a oh, reasonable well, discussion. Well, you're all, we're already on step one, but the head of a scientific institution is saying we need to take it down rather hey did these guys have a point exactly yeah that we need that's to right. do an that's investigation right. of the facts i i asked myself right how that's my point it. yes yeah david and i agree with all you of that point. I, I i was asked myself a lot of times what would i have done if i were in francis Holland's shoes and what i would have done is i would have brought these rogue epidemiologists in and had a discussion with them try to figure out where they're coming from and then decide should i put them in a platform in a debate or should i just figure out some other way to like manage them I wouldn't have done they, it. You're missing the human element. They want to be heroes. Yeah. Yeah. So if they listen to you, that cuts down the hero. Yeah. But look at what that sentence said. They, 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 they would have been heroes for yeah. following the Barrington Declaration, protecting the elderly, yeah. grandma yeah. doesn't die, and kids get to go back to school. Exactly. People don't even think about being heroes for the change or not. Sorry. But say, Okay, so here's what they did, right? So, um, and, and I'm, and I'm just telling you, I didn't know about this email at the time. What I, what I knew at the time was that the, the information of Ryan was not was unlike anything I'd encountered in my 20 plus year career as a, as a scholar, right? What, what the information environment looked like to me was that there was no chance of a of, of anyone giving me a fair hearing at all. And part of part of the problem was the the way that we that this is now apart from apart from like how we manage uh, the politics of of, uh, of, 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 of of hierarchies in science. How do we manage the politics of hierarchies in society? We, we partly do that now through social media. We do that through our, our ability to get our message out in media and social media. And that was that was something I had almost no experience with before the pandemic. Um, so I'll just tell you that I'm going to go through a little bit of, of my own experience with this 
with the Great Banking Operation, just to, just to get, give you a sense of the, 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 uh, the, the, the environment that I, that, uh, that I faced. And remember, the goal was, my goal was to try to get people to uh, have a debate. Uh, in fact, at Stanford, uh, the, John Hennessy, the former president, reached out to me trying to organize a debate in December of 2020 and couldn't find anybody on the other side willing to debate me. And at my own department would refuse to impanel a, a, a policy discussion about COVID policy. I, I, I work in the Department of Health Policy now. Right? So it was it was a remarkable kind of environment in both the university setting, but I'm going to focus on social media. Uh, so first, uh, I joined Twitter in August of 2021 because I wanted to tell people about the Great Branch Declaration and about sort of the, the mistakes that I, in my view people were making in COVID policy. Um, uh, it, when I first joined, I had this sense that I, because so many of my friends had joined had been, that had been had been suppressed as soon as they, so for instance, Martin Kulder put a post up, a very reasonable post uh, in early, in mid-2021, I think June, June, June 2021, where he, where he wrote, that cloth masks don't work by recommending them to older people. Many older people may have died because they thought the masks were protecting them when they didn't. A basic moral hazard kind of point that every economist in the room is going to nod at. It's like obviously, it's a, it may, I mean, who knows exactly the estimate? No one's done a very, very careful empirical study, but that, the idea that that's possible, yeah, that is absolutely possible. And he was, he was, booted off of Twitter until he deleted that tweet for a month, right? So I knew that the social media environment was not amenable to real free thinking, right? Even in basic economic points, you're not allowed to say. Uh, so I was, when I joined Twitter, I was very careful. I, I, I'd been a student of Twitter actually before, for the year before. And so I figured out what the envelope was of what I could and couldn't say that would get me, you know, demoted. So Rich Frankel has a question. Rich, do you to ask your question? <clears throat> Please unmute yourself. Have any of these people asked you for forgiveness? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's been there's been a few people who I've reconciled with. I I have um I have a I have a religious commitment to forgiving even my enemies. I've 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 got to practice that quite a lot during the pandemic. Uh, uh, I, I don't. I think the key thing now is just an assessment of what went wrong. I don't personally expect a lot of people to forgive. And a lot, I mean, like what Jonathan was saying is, I think part of it is like a lot of people thought of themselves as heroes and they acted like monsters. It's really hard to like come back from that. Um, uh, I, you know, I've made a lot of new friends, Rich. So you know, next time we we we, we can we can become some. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so I I, I knew that I, what, what I couldn't couldn't say on Twitter, and I was very very careful. Uh, but and I actually had some success. Like I almost got a hundred thousand followers almost immediately on joining Twitter. I thought that was amazing. Like, yeah. I was like, okay, this is this is. I was looking at uh, at this and saying, like, okay, I'm having a having some impact. Um, the problem was that my tweets would uh, would get a, would 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 meet a lot of approval. Now you think that's a good thing, but I'm saying some very controversial things. What I actually wanted on Twitter was to reach the other side. I wanted to reach people that disagreed with me. I mean, I was willing to take the abuse of being on Twitter because I knew that that's the only way I could reach the other side. And uh, and it was funny. It's like you know, of course, it's fine not to be abused directly. That's that that's not not, not the most fun thing. But I had already I already been abused, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna. I mean, given that I've already paid that cost, my skin is thicker. I may as well go all the way and try to like engage the other side in this debate or discussion. Um, Barry Weiss, who I guess it's coming next week. Uh, when Elon bought Twitter, uh, she, they, uh, the, uh, she, she, he invited in a bunch of independent journalists uh, to go look at the databases of Twitter up in Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. Um, she wrote a piece, but she went up there and she, she, for whatever reason, decided to like look my, my Twitter account up. And here's what she found. This, this is a screenshot that she took of the Twitter Jira database of my account. Um, you can't see this on, on actual Twitter. I, I was active. I, I guess by this is in late 2022. I already had 240,000 followers. Uh, trends blacklist. Trends blacklist. What is it? No, I, I was pretty proud of the strike count zero. I had been very careful about understanding what the censors were, would allow and didn't allow. Um, uh, the trends blacklist meant that you could see my posts if you followed me. But if you didn't follow me, there's zero chance of you seeing my post. Hmm. 
it, it was it was you know my my posts would not trend, meaning like go viral in communities that are far outside of my social media circle. Like go direct direct followers. So retweets wouldn't work. Retweets might be able to like get re reduce it, but the algorithm would try to reduce the visibility even of the retweets. Okay. If, it, if you're on a trends black. And so uh, Elon invited me to go back up to Twitter and visit with them when this happened. I drove and I drove up thinking to myself that uh, up the peninsula to, to, to Twitter headquarters in San thinking this this drive cost Elon $44 billion, the most expensive drive in the history of drives. Um, I don't know, maybe that's not true, but it, it was certainly the most expensive drive I'll ever take. Um, and then, and I, and, and, and I, uh, and I looked at this database and a, a Twitter engineer, I asked a, a Twitter engineer to show me when was I put on this trans blacklist? It turns out that I was put on this trans blacklist the day I joined Twitter uh, uh, in August, 2021. Um, this was the tweet, the first tweet that I did, or the first or second tweet that I did. Uh, about this trend about that led to the tr the first trans blackness. Um, it was the Great Barrington Declaration. The Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, it's still my pin tweet. Uh, just to you know, uh, I mean, I, I had this my pin tweet is like that's the purpose of joining Twitter is to tell others about the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, I mean, I'm still. It, I guess it's it's um it's it's surprising that now I have okay. This is this, I did this uh, when I remember when I pulled this thing, but like now I have almost four hundred fifty thousand followers. The trans blacklist also reduced the number of followers I have. I, no, no cry for me. I have a ridiculous number of followers. That's not the that's not the point. The point is that the trans blacklist. Why did the government? Well, I'm sorry. Why did Twitter put me on a trans blacklist the day I joined? I hadn't put any. I didn't put anything abusive up. I, I just put up the the Great Parenting Declaration. Right again. Again, you may agree or disagree. The question is why. Why would why would they do this? It makes no sense from a business perspective. The, the purpose of Twitter is to generate conversation. The more conversation is generated, the, the, the better off Twitter is. Right? And I wasn't saying anything illegal. I was just saying a great declaration. Okay. Uh, YouTube censors Governor DeSantis and me. Uh, in March of 2021, uh, Governor DeSantis invited me. Uh, that's Scott Atlas on the left, Martin Kuldorf, and then Governor DeSantis and me. Uh, on the screen is Sunetra Gupta, which you can't see. To join remotely. This was a March 2021 policy roundtable, um, or flew to Florida, and here you see the governor asking me whether there's any evidence that masking children does anything for the pandemic. And I, I knew he was going to ask me this, so I had done my homework. Uh, there are no randomized studies whatsoever on children and masking. So there's no high quality evidence at all demonstrating that masking children does nothing. The, uh, the, the, while the CDC, the US CDC recommends masking for two year olds and below at the time, um, the World Health Organization said no masking below six and the e European CDC said no masking below 12. The reason for these differences in recommendations by these big organizations is because the, the evidence on masking children is abysmal, as in there's zero, no randomized studies whatsoever. Um, um, on the basis of that, the US CDC had recommended masking two-year-olds. Um, so I said this to the, the governor. Um, and and I, you know, and and uh, this uh, this is there's a YouTube video of this that was put up by a local news channel of the governor talking to scientific advisors, right? Uh, YouTube censors the that video almost immediately. Why does the YouTube censor a video? of a, a sitting governor of a state talking to scientific advisors. I mean, that, I thought that's good government. I mean, you, you agree or again, agree or disagree, at least you get to see the, the basis on which uh, the governor is making his decisions, right? That's not that part of a good, good, good government system. You know, there's no reason why ta taxpayers and citizens ought not be able to see that. And yet YouTube censors this video the day after you do it. Um, this censoring, by the way, led on campus to a hundred of my colleagues circulating a secret petition a few months later, asking the president of the university to, to censor me, to silence me. Um, okay. Uh, this is different than the Scott Atlas one? Yeah, this is the second petition. Most people have heard of this. I actually, what I did with that is I, I by that time, I'd had media allies. So I asked some friends in the media to go ask the president who's planning to censor me. And then, of course, he had to say no because it would be an embarrassment to, to Stanford to, to say that, you know, we no longer support academic freedom. Um, uh, okay. Uh, when we put the Great Barrington Declaration up, uh, this is, by the way, this is still during the Trump administration, mind you, this is before the Biden administration, October 2020. Um, if you Googled us in many, many countries, what you'd see is 
the, the Great French Declaration page itself, the, at, on the first day with the top, top results. By the third day, there was a, a very large number of hit pieces on us that would be put above us. You have to go to like page three before you found the actual Great French Declaration. Um, you'd see, and, and some countries didn't have had it on at all. Like if you, you know, people were sending us, you know, uh, reports from like, you know, the Maldive Islands or something, I can't find you on Google. Um, and so it was, it was, uh, it was, you know, and so like we had this, this, uh, Fraser Myers, who's, who's an editor for uh, Spike, wrote this, wrote this up to document this. Um, Facebook also took down the Great French Declaration page. I'll just, I'll just leave that aside. Um, it, it's interesting because the, uh, the, this is a FOIA email from Mark Zuckerberg to Francis, to uh, Tony Fauci in March 15th, 2020, very close to the beginnings of the lockdown. And in it, Mark Zuckerberg essentially offers all the help that Fauci wants to communicate the science to his Facebook audience. Uh, he also offers to do something which is now blacked out. I'm not sure what it is. I would love dearly to know what Mark Zuckerberg offered the second thing. That, but uh, if you look at the subsequent emails, Tony Fauci was very, very excited about the ability to work with Mark Zuckerberg. Your proposal sounds terrific. Um, uh, I'm copying my special assistant, her, her office number is please have your people contact her to arrange for the video. So now then you can see Fauci later in a video talking to, 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 to Zuckerberg. He, he got that, but then he also got some special cooperation. Um, I, I only learned later what the special cooperation is. I'm about to get to that. And here's, of course, Facebook deleted the Great Britain Declaration for a week after we put the we, we, we put it up. This, and it's striking that this happened during the, the during the Trump administration. The date of this article, it says February twenty. Oh, oh yeah, Facebook it's a, suppressed us in February. Google suppressed us in October twenty twenty. Um, so you have that. You have like essentially. During two administrations, you're having this social media suppression of alternate viewpoints. Um, I learned during, uh, like, like, I'll just fast forward now to August of 2022. I've been very active in the anti lockdown debate, and I've been uh, active in, in other ways as, as a pro bono expert in a, a series of anti vaccine mandate cases, anti mask mandate cases, and anti lockdown cases, church open cases. Um, and uh, the, in uh, including with the Missouri Attorney General's office in one of the cases. And so uh, I, I considered after all this like censorship, whether I could personally like privately sue Facebook or Google or, or whatnot. And I concluded that there was no way to win that. That there had been a number of other suits that had happened against, uh, against these companies and all of them failed because these are private companies and they have the right to you know, put up what they want, but not put up what they want effectively. Um, and I decided against it. But when the Missouri Attorney General's office contacted me, said they wanted to sue the Biden administration because they thought that it wasn't that the censorship wasn't organic. It wasn't that these companies by themselves decided that they want to put me on a blacklist. It's that there was there was federal direction that led to the, the social media censorship. That was the theory of the case. And I thought, okay, we don't know that for certain, but it would be it sure would be interesting to have discovery inside what was happening in, uh, in, in, in the administration to see if that is the case. Uh, so um, there were other reasons to think that the federal government was involved. In, um, in July of 2021, the, uh, the head of the, 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 the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, the, the man named Vivek Murthy, uh, put out a call to the, the people of America to identify, tell them who is misinforming uh, identify the mis misinformers. If you see it, say something. And the implication is that the Surgeon General's office will do something. Tell us who is misinforming. Surgeon General warns misinformation is urgent threat to public health. And then he added that with a public call to inform all the misinformers. So the uh, the uh, the Indiana Attorney General asked me if I would be willing to help put a submission to the Surgeon General. Which we did. I, I did with Martin Kuldorf. We, we basically said that the most important misinformer in the country was actually the federal government itself. And we listed, uh, uh, you know, here's the, here's the, so here's the head of the letter. We agree that misinformation has been a major problem during the pandemic. We submit the following examples of disinformation from the CDC and other health organizations that have shattered public trust in, in science. 
Uh, and we listed nine different things, but like, you know, questioning whether immunity after COVID recovery produces immunity, it absolutely does. A lot of evidence at the time had already said that, and yet the federal government had made in court, court filings that said that that, that, that wasn't true. Um, that, that, that the COVID vaccines prevent transmission. The federal government had said repeatedly, including Tony Fauci himself, that if you get the vaccines, you are not going to get COVID, you're not going to spread COVID. That was false based on a, a huge evidence base that had already been developed by like middle of 2021. Uh, from from places like you know uh, places like Qatar, published in you know like places like the New England Journal, um, school closures were effective and costless. Uh, that was the implication uh, that that Tony Fauci said in, in throughout 2020, for instance, everyone's equally at risk of hospitalizations and death from COVID. Right? I, I in fact I testified in Congress in August of 2021 and got viciously attacked by Jamie Raskin, the Democratic uh, congressman, for saying that not everyone's equally at risk. Um, the fact there's this ma massive age gradient interest, mass managed or effective in reducing spread of viral diseases. The Cochrane report that le that led out that the that documented that the literature doesn't actually support the idea that mass mandates or the mass work. Um, there were actually versions of that in 2020 that said the exact same thing. The CDC had its own evidence report about the, the evidence on mass mandates that they concluded there was insufficient evidence. This is in 2020. That, that, to show the mass work. And there was no evidence that, that came up afterwards that, that reversed decades of experience with this. Um, and finally, the eradication of COVID-19 is a feasible goal. You, you can find uh, very prominent scientists and some of them government affiliated, but more, mainly in the UK, you know, government affiliated ones. Uh, so do, you, do you have a sense that, that the federal government was crucial for these companies to start censoring you know, the debate? Because it seems to me, but the culture as a whole was actually pretty censorious, right? You see the letters that your your own colleagues were circulating. So when I get a sense of to what extent the federal government was crucial, or maybe these you know companies are themselves very overzealous and, and ideologically when, when they try to moderate speech online. I mean, I, I think um, I think there is a little bit of a two-way street. Like it's it, I think that there were elements outside of the government that wanted censorship. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of those in just a bit. Um, and and they, they pressured the government to censor. Uh, the, but I think the government's decision to, to essentially use its influence and power with social media companies played a decisive role in the establishment of the censorship. I think that, the, you know, it, like if you're on the government side, you basically, if you, if you get outside pressure to censor, your job is to tell the, that person to go take a hike. Right, you don't, your job is to say, look, we are a free society. We do not censor. Our job is not to censor speech. Our job, your job, maybe as a CDC, to like put out good studies. Right, that's much more effective, I think, than censoring speech. Like there's a, there's a thing called a strike sand effect, where if you say that some no one some, no one should see X, well, everyone goes and sees X. Right, like a, if someone told me, when I was little, someone told me a book was banned. The first thing I want to do is go to the library and find that book. Right, that's essentially what what they were doing. What they were, you know, the, the problem they're doing here. I, I think. Um, so the, the deep, the deeper one is the boy who cried wolf. Now that they have been exposed to politically lying, who's going to believe them next time when it's actually crucial? That yeah, you know, we do believe. Yeah, and, and that's why why I'm listing these lists because these were themes that were correct that that the government itself deemed as misinformation. Right, the government was suppressing true facts. Even though they're true, simply because it was it undermined government policy. Yes, that's the problem. Yeah, fundamentally, that's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, like the government is not the policy; it undermines it. No, no, no. The ends justify the means. Right. So, so for instance, just just to take number five, everyone was equally at risk. Why did the government push this idea? Why was this like they thought that young people would be responsible? Exactly. Exactly. They say they thought yeah. that if you if everyone thought if people realized how low the risk there is to babies from dying from COVID, well then they maybe those the parents then wouldn't wouldn't mask up their children. Maybe they wouldn't consent to keeping their children home from school and 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 and, and essentially delay their development and learning for two years. Maybe they wouldn't comply with the lockdown orders. Maybe they wouldn't do all the things the government wanted them to do. It was an act of manipulation. By changing what people thought of as true, even though it wasn't true. Yeah, I think the government instilled so much fear throughout the population that there was just so much irrational thinking and non scientific thinking. 
That is, it, again, that's the second major breach of scientific authorities, that they are now psychologists in chief. Even if their policy was right, they now view their job as lying to us in order to manipulate us into doing their policy. Well, I mean, it, take that last one. It's, it put climate change in there. It, yeah. it, climate change is a feasible goal. But stopping climate, the climate, the warming is a feasible goal. It's completely infeasible. Jonathan, it's a climate emergency. <laughs> Use your proper maps. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 like I, I mean, I view science as a fundamentally humble thing, right? Like everyone's wrong when they do science at yeah. some point. Yes, right. Right, and so like, and so has a government or some government official take on themselves as a mantle of, you know, I. If you contradict me, you're not simply contradicting men, you're contradicting science itself. That itself is an alarm signal. And then to use the power of government to censor. So I still, I still have to establish that we're using the power of government to censor. Yeah. Let me do that with Mr. Spider. Jay, can I point something now? Oh, yeah, that, dude. Uh, when I was on Laura Ingram's show the first time, she showed me an actual clip of Fauci admitting that he lied about masks, saying they were ineffective in order that the doctors would have more masks. So this was something he admitted that he was trying to manipulate people. I mean, David, he did this over and over. Like that, that noble lie tactic, that was a that was a standard tactic of public health. That yeah. he was supposed to do that. Like he did it again, by the way, David, uh, on the on the vaccines. He remember he said at one point he said, uh, if you we need about 60% of the population to be vaccinated and the, the disease will go away because of herd immunity. And then he says 70, then he says 80, then he says 90. And later he's like, oh, the reason I told you 60 is because I, I didn't think you were ready to hear that it was actually 90. Right. And not one bit of math or evidence underlies any of that. Like right. you can't point to actual study that says 60, 70, 80, or 90, because yes. it depends on how effective the disease of the vaccine is at preventing you from getting and spreading COVID and how long that lasts, right? right. The math of that is going to be complicated. There's not going to be some one single number. It was just, it was just a... But once you have high public health officials admit that they are engaging in manipulation of the public through noble lies, uh, who's going to believe them, right? Uh, the boy cried wolf is exactly the right right thing, as Sean said. Um, okay, uh, this is the Missouri versus Biden case. Um, and we, in August 2022, we put this uh, we put this case in, and I actually was like, I didn't know what was going to come out of it, right? I, I wrote an affidavit just detailing a lot of what had happened in being, in being censored. Um, also on the case with Martin Kulldorff, uh, Aaron Cariotti was a, a bioethicist in UC Irvine who lost his job because he objected to vaccine mandates from a, a tenured position at UC Irvine, also was on this case. Um, and uh, what he's, and then Jill Hines, uh, so, so, uh, who's a, who's a uh, health freedom activist in, in Louisiana. Uh, so with the Louisiana and Missouri Attorney General's Office against the Biden administration. We uh, we got discovery in the case. Discovery meant that we got to read the emails from a dozen federal agencies, from the White House itself, from the CDC, the Surgeon General's Office, from the from the FBI, the uh, the, the State Department. A dozen federal agencies gave us their emails uh, in their communications with Twitter, Facebook, you know, Google, and so on, and. Uh, we got to depose a dozen major figures inside the federal government, including Tony Fauci himself. You can go see the, the eight-hour deposition of Tony Fauci online, um, where he says, I, in response to basic questions about, well, what was the scientific basis of this statement you said? Uh, did, and he says, I don't recall 179 times in eight hours. <laughs> Reminds me of the Nixon hearings. It really, really. Watergate. <laughs> um, and, and so it, when the judge, the judge in the case, Terry Dowdy, who's a federal judge, uh, ruled, this is on July 4th of 2023, this year. Uh, there's no way he rules on July 4th. I think it was like a, sat a, a, a Saturday or something. He, put, he, goes, <laughs> um, he rules because he wanted to send a message. Uh, and here's the, here's the argument to his rule. This case involves some of the most egregious First Amendment violations in American history. Federal officials of the White House and multiple agencies used pressure threats, coercion, cajoling, collusion, demands, trickery, and deceit to induce social media platforms to censor speakers and viewpoints on social media that federal officials disdain. Um, White House officials like Rob, Rob Flaherty, Andy Slavic, Jen Psaki, the, the Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, the CDC, Dr. Fauci orchestrated an elaborate campaign of trickery and deception to induce social media platforms to censor the lab leak theory and other viewpoints he favors. 
the lab leak theory, right? That that theory came up and turned into a conspiracy theory in early 2020, right? You remember the email from from uh, 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 from Zuckerberg to Fauci? They, they they made something that was an active theory that actually probably is true that it was a lab. Leak. Right, it's certain. Yeah. yeah, very likely yeah, it's true. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I, I, I mean, I, I, the only people now I think maintaining it's not true are people directly in, implicated in the lab leak, uh, very very close to that, or virologists, or virologists who see their field about to disappear into you know, smithereens. Um, uh, according to the fact that oh, here's the hundred. I saw I said 179. It's actually 174 times he said. I don't recall in the interview. Uh, you should put that 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 video. Don't spend all eight hours reading the the uh, the, the deposition, but just just go take a a, a, a gander at it. It's all online. Um, uh, this is from the judge's uh, judge's uh, ruling, the July fourth ruling. The Great Grandchild Corporation, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins collaborated to inflict a quick, deceptive, quick and devastating takedown of the Great Grandchild Corporation. Uh, the uh, doc, since Dr. Cliff Lane's trip to China at Dr. Fauci's direction in February 20, 2020, Dr. Fauci and the government establishment favor the Chinese government's novel tactic of aggressive lockdowns to control the virus spread. So the Great Grandchild Corporation is a great threat to the credibility of lockdown policy. The, 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 what he's referring to is in, 20, in 2020, February 2020, the World Health Organization sent a junket to China because China had just locked down its, its, its Wuhan and uh, the, the Hubei province for a, month, for a full month, and they declared victory over COVID. The World Health Organization sent the, the, uh, a group of people to, ch to China to see what they'd done right. And, and there was a huge, if you look at the FOIA emails, a huge brouhaha over how to get someone from the NIH on there. Cliff Lane ends up going, Cliff Lane is Tony Fauci's deputy. Comes back, they write a report that says uh, that, that, that what China did worked, that they, albeit at great cost, they su suppressed the lockdown. Then the World Health Organization recommended lockdown at scale in that report. That's the, it's the major key understanding why the world moved into lockdown is that report saying that what China did worked. Um, and, and for Tony Fauci, he had put his entire, a, a huge amount of his credibility behind this. And so to have scientists from Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, tens of thousands of scientists, a Nobel Prize winner contradicted, shattered the, the illusion that there was a consensus in favor of lockdowns, which is really, really damaging to him. It doesn't matter that it was true. All that mattered was that someone had contradicted it. But now, if you, if you win the lawsuit, but does that mean there's any consequences for the federal government? We'll, we'll get to that, because I, there's a, the consequence is still at play, what the consequence is going to be. It's really, really important. Uh, but I saw a couple of things set up before we get to that. Um, the the lawsuit demonstrated, uh, in, in response to Yvonne's question, actually, a private-public partnership to censor Americans. And that private-public partnership among the actors in that public a uh, private partnership includes Stanford University itself. Uh, this, the, the, so the, the two entities here, CISA and GEC, um, these are entities, one, CISA I think is in the State Department, GEC is inside the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the federal, federal health officials, they, what, they, what they did is they engaged and funded private actors inside universities, places like Harvard, Stanford, the University of Washington, to generate a hit list of censorship and also other NGOs, right? Probably the most famous of this is the Disinformation Dozen uh, report produced by an entity called the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which listed people who, uh, including RFK Jr. as rabid anti-vaxxers who need to be essentially taken down from every single platform. Americans taken down from every single platform. Um, uh, the, uh, in, in, in the discovery documents, we have, uh, we found that the EIP, this is the Election Integrity Project, that's a project housed at Stanford, um, was formulated, formulated as a means to accomplish what the government is forbidden to do under the First Amendment. Alex Stane also at Stanford, as publicly stated in, at the NFSI, stated the EIP was formed in part because the government lacked legal authorizations to engage in EIP's work. The EIP tries to fill a gap of things the government cannot do themselves. Renee Garesta, also at Stanford, uh, also admits the EIP was designed to get around problems of very real First Amendment questions that would arise if federal officials did the EIP's monitoring and censorship work correct. This is from the judge's decision. Yes, this is from the judge's decision. Because I think it's going to come up in the in the faculty senate 
in a week. The president would promise to report back. That would be wonderful to hear. Uh, but I mean, maybe I, I would take that. Which point. president? This, uh, what happened was Jeff asked the president, what about this? He said, I have no idea. I will get back to you next time. <laughs> he's gone. And he's gone. What? No, no. Say, say. The old oh, man. Okay. It's happened a week ago. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So he's going to report back. Well, this this is, this is let me just tell you, this is a very, but very those promises thing. to report back are. Um, well, well, no, no. Okay, you can ask him again. You said you were yeah, back when I went the fuck out. Yeah. Hopefully somebody will. So, yeah, Jeff will for sure. Uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's one more fact here. It's really important. Um, Stamos in a deposition in, to the, the U.S. Judiciary, House Judiciary Committee on Weaponization of Government said that, 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 that Stanford has spent millions, at least a million dollars or more in legal fees defending these activities. Stanford, not the EIP itself. So this is official, essentially official Stanford position um, that it's that, that that is going to do this. That's doing this. Um, the uh, Biden administration appealed this decision on July fourth. So what were the original decision? There's an aspect of this that, as an economist who studies regulation of government, I gather there was threats. So why did the social media companies go along? I gather there was threats. Oh, we'll let the regulators loose on you and close you down. Now, um, nobody even noticed this because, of course, the government can just send regulators to anybody. But wait a minute. Regulation is supposed to follow rules and procedures and, and be, you know, not, not, we're not allowed to send in the fire code regulators to shut you down because we don't like what you're saying. Fire code regulators are supposed to watch the fire code. Yeah. Um, so do you have specifics? It, it does the case include specifics of which regulators were going to be sent in to shut you down uh, it's, it's a lot. because this is just a it's not the first amendment it's it's violent um uh, the, the administrative procedures act every bit of constraint on regulators that says you're supposed to follow rules seems to be thrown out yeah, so John, a, a lot of these emails it looks like cooperation but it's like stockholm syndrome cooperation right so there's an implied threat by right, Section 230, for instance, we, we're, we're considering Section 230 reform. If you, do, if you do Section 230 reform, you get away the liability protection. These social media companies cease to exist, right? So that, that's that's in the background. There's so also like we'll negotiations. We'll send in the EEOC to accuse you. Yeah, I, 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 I see. Yeah. Well, it's like as simple as a revolving door with Frank Pitts. That these are the former bosses, the power work. Yeah, a lot of them do work for Facebook or Google. Right. But uh, but one of, there's one other aspect of this. So uh, the European regulation of social media uh, is much more draconian in some ways than the American one. Uh, and there are these like data privacy rules that essentially would make it almost impossible for social media to, to function. But for the fact that the American government has negotiated with the EU, that there are like these loopholes. <laughs> and uh, the, the, there are, uh, what the House Judiciary Committee discovered is that there were explicit promises made to Facebook, for instance, that um, that they would not that, that that they would negotiate on behalf of, of Facebook and other social media companies with the EU, and the threat was we will stop representing you. Right. Yes. Um, so it's not this is like it's not like hypothetical. It's uh, these these companies. Well, I wanted to understand what the nature of the threats was. Yeah. I mean, exactly which other laws got violated along the way. <laughs> uh, right. So it's. It, I mean, you should read the evidentiary record. It's just, it's just shocking, right? It's, 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 it's what led to the press, right? I mean, it's, it's one of these things where, like, you just read it. And in fact, the guy, uh, did I put the Ministry of Truth? I didn't put the Ministry of Truth. Uh, this, this guy, uh, the, the Terry, Terry Davi, the, the judge in the case, concludes the, the ruling with saying that the government has established, in effect, a de facto Ministry of Truth. A de facto, a, a, a de facto Ministry of Truth uh, in this country. Um, you know, or, or he says Orwellian Ministry of Truth, right? So you don't miss it. <laughs> uh, and the the uh, okay, before I get to the the, the appeal, uh, here's what happened. The, the the judge told he had two items in his preliminary injunction. Item one, that the Biden administration and any of these agencies are no longer allowed to contact social media companies with direct demands for uh, suppressing speech. Right. No, how much time do I have? Am I doing okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Um, the, the, um, uh, they, they're no longer allowed to contact and, and, and essentially say, you know, suppress these people and these ideas. 
They're no longer allowed to contact with demands to suppress speech. And second, they're no longer allowed to engage with third parties to develop a hit list for censorship. Right? Those are the two items that, that, that we were enjoined by the, 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 the uh, district judge, the district federal judge. Um, here's the House uh, amicus brief uh, filed in our case. Uh, when the, when the, when the, so the Biden administration appeals immediately to the Fifth Circuit District, uh, Fifth, Fifth, Fifth Circuit uh, Court, and says, look, if we are not allowed to censor, people are going to die. We need to have this power to censor. In effect, that's what they what they ask for. Um, the House Judiciary Committee uh, files, uh, the Republicans in it really, file a, uh, an amicus brief in the case saying, the government's pressure campaign worked. Facebook agreed to moderate certain COVID-related speech in response to pressure by administration. The pressure was direct and coercive. Um, on the lab leak theory, uh, an, ex an executive in charge of content policy said, because we are under pressure from the administration to do so, we're going to censor. Right? They directly say that they're censoring because of the pressure in, in emails. Not, not every email says that. A lot of it is like Stockholm Syndrome, but like there are enough emails to say that for being company after company, you have to, a direct attack by the government on these companies telling them they must censor. Do you have any other specific areas that they stand for Internet Observatory or the Stanford Plurality Project recommended censoring you or any other Stanford faculty? I don't have anything specific about me. Um, yeah, I don't have a specific thing about me. It, it, you know, it, it's, yeah, nothing specific about me. Uh, a, a senior advisor to President Biden was outraged that Facebook, this is Rob Flaherty actually, that did not remove a theme that bothered the administration. It, it essentially it was a it was a it was a, it was, a, it, was a, it was a it was a silly theme about like you know if a hundred years from now, fifty years from now people are like unhappy about the vaccine is the implication. Um, it was just a silly picture, right? Um, the, uh, the Biden administration pressured Facebook to censor information about vaccine side effects, even if the information was true, right? So there are vaccine injuries. There are people, for instance, young men who got myocarditis from the vaccine, Facebook groups have formed support groups. And the Biden administration pressured the Facebook to suppress those groups so the patients couldn't speak to the, each other about like how to how to you know get better from the from the vaccine issue. Um, there's a funny or I think did I put this here? There's a very funny thing. Um, oh yeah, here we go. The, uh, this is from the this is from the amicus brief from the from the House Judiciary Committee. The federal government threatened big tech with repeal of Section 230 to induce compliance with the censure campaign. Mark Zuckerberg has referred to the possibility of antitrust enforcement as an existential threat to his empire. Internal documents show Facebook executives feared the Biden administration would retaliate against the company for not censoring enough. Um, there's a really funny uh, thing that happened at one point in April of 2021. The uh, CDC put out an announcement that they were pausing the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. You remember that? That was because it had a it had a, a sort of some side effects that they didn't expect in, 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 in women in thrombocytopenia and, and clotting. Uh, the algorithms that Facebook had to identify anti-vax group identified the White House itself as an anti-vax group because <laughs> it had shared the CDC page. <laughs> it had been, and, and those algorithms were in part because of the censorship demands by the White House. Right? It's not, so it's it's not like it, it's not like we could just do this and surgically pick out things, true or false, only only get rid of false things. It it takes it, it captures even true things. Um, so uh, the preliminary injunction, um, the, the preliminary injunction said that the, the, the plaintiffs are likely to see, that's, that's, that's me, uh, likely to see on this case that the government has used power to silence the opposition, opposition to COVID-19 vaccines, opposition to COVID-19 masking and lockdowns, opposition to the lab leak theory. The evidence produced thus far depicts an almost dystopian scenario during the COVID-19 pandemic, a period perhaps best characterized by widespread doubt and uncertainty. The US government seems to have assumed a role similar to the Orwellian Ministry of Truth. The plaintiffs have presented substantial evidence in support of the claim that they were victims of a far-reaching and widespread censorship campaign. Actually, the opposition quotes keep going in, in very tasty directions. <laughs> I have no idea. I almost cried when I read this. This is like July 4th. I wrote this like emotional thing. I published this very wise thing, a uh, free press, where it was reflecting on my- July 4th, what year? 2023. 2023. So what about, then is it going to be an appeal that they use again, right? Yeah, this currently it's sitting at the Supreme Court right now. 
Yeah, so they lost the appeal in the in the in the in the Fifth Circuit. So here, here's the so the Fifth Circuit heard the case and then we issued the preliminary injunction. Now remember the preliminary injunction by the, the judge in the district court said two things that the government couldn't do. They couldn't directly coerce social media to censor. They can't even contact them for that purpose. And then second, that they're not allowed to, to essentially develop the hit list for censorship by working with non-governmental organizations like Stanford. Um, the Fifth Circuit modified that preliminary injunction. I'm not going to read it in full, but it'll just tell you what it did is essentially kept the first bit. They're still not allowed to go tell social media companies, censor this, censor these people and these ideas. But they are now, under the Fifth Circuit order, allowed to contract with outside of the agencies. Right? That's not unconstitutional. It's essentially what the Fifth Circuit is implying. Is there, A, any other remedy that is being suggested and b is there a uh, direction that they have if they're going to do anything they have to be transparent about what they're doing which would be more well, likely than you you shall not talk <laughs> when you talk you've got to well the next the next one permanent injunction as soon as you find evidence that there is talking and now the social media companies have a, an incentive to say these guys are coming and bugging us you now have a cause of action because these you know whoever came and bugged the social media companies inside the federal government you can you can sue them for contempt of court while the preliminary injunction is in place the, the permanent thing is, is going to be, there's still going to have to be a trial, right? This is a preliminary injunction. It's going to have to be a trial. That will determine the final thing. But what's interesting is, I, if, let's actually. The, the preliminary injunction goes to the Supreme Court, and then we start the trial. And yes. Then we'll, we'll yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So right now, the, 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 the Supreme Court is hearing the preliminary they agree injunction. They've agreed to hear it. Yes. Well, they, they've agreed to, yes, they've agreed to, to hear it. I don't know if they'll just issue a thing saying, we'll keep the preliminary injunction in place, or they'll issue a long, long thing. But it seems, I mean, if, the only concern is that old man, old woman, people that are most worried about COVID, right? I mean, you, this actually the court was okay. The on women are cold. Cold. What? The women, women are cold. Um, okay. they, they pretty much understand the First Amendment. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so I have I, what, what I call this now is a censorship two step, right? The government funds uh, NGOs and universities to develop a hit list for social media censorship, and under the July Fourth ruling of uh, the district court. It's a uh, preliminary injunction. It's prohibited that they, that, they, that they do that, but it's permitted under the Fifth Circuit. Uh, then, then the second step of this two-step is the government leans on social media companies, says you must censor this, uh, these ideas and these people. They're so evil and wrong and bad that they, even though they're American citizens engaged in legal speech, that you must censor them. And that's prohibited under both the federal district court ruling and the, the Fifth Circuit. So of course, hearing the, the Fifth Circuit ruling so they're going to rule on the second thing. It is almost inconceivable to me that this court would say, yes, the government can censor. And who appealed to the Supreme Court when the government? The Biden administration did, yeah. The Biden administration. Again, yeah. the same. Then it goes back to the lower courts. Now, let's say that you win the lower courts. Let's say you went all the way through. What happens? That's the question, right? So um, uh, let me let me just stop. This is actually the end of my presentation, so let me just stop here because I want to. I, that's the conversation that I wanted to have at the end of this. Um, so I think first, what the, what the Biden administration did, and I think even before, what the some of the agencies were doing the, during the Trump administration was just plainly unconstitutional. Yes. Right. That is that that and and if there is no remedy for that, then that like essentially the, the Constitution is a, the First Amendment is a dead letter. I don't think the courts are going to permit that. Right, so I think what will happen is that these rulings will allow uh, uh, essentially courts to, uh, to to give standing to people that think they've been censored by government action, allow there to be uh, allow there to be uh, uh, you know sort of discovery, and it, you'll see the lawsuits come flooding for people that think they were censored and probably were censored based based on this this two step. Do you want to join because the question is John mute yourself. Hi, Jay. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I have trouble with one thing, right? I, I actually don't know what to think about uh, this Internet observatory and that whole milieu. Um, so, yes, Stanford has has spent money to defend their right to do something, whatever they do. Um, I think that in itself is not objectionable. And, and Jonathan, I think you said that, well, this means that what they're doing is Stanford doing it. I don't think that's true. I think they're defending the, the, the right of these, this institution, this center to um, 
to conduct its research, to say what it says. The problem with Stanford is that the inconsistency between how they react to that and how they react to Jay and Scott and so forth and so on on, on the other side, saying saying very different things. Um, so it's not clear to me. I think it's a very difficult legal question whether the government's funding, and I don't actually know whether they, they do fund it directly, but the government's funding of an institution that says what we're going to do is we're going to find misinformation and we're going to inform the social media companies about that misinformation. Uh, that's not the government forcing anything. That's it's not forcing the uh, Internet Observatory uh, to find what they want to find. Uh, it's not forcing the social media companies. So. So I actually agree with the, uh, I agree that it shouldn't be prohibited for the government to fund universities who have proposed to study a particular thing. You know, uh, The government should not be permitted, absolutely should not be permitted to uh, lean on social media companies to censor people on the, re on the basis of these results. So anyway, I think, John, it's a, I think it's a subtle question. John, I agree with that. Uh, in fact, I agree with I, I, almost everything you said, right? So I think, the, especially the first part, I very fundamentally agree. I think academic freedom requires uh, Stanford to be tolerant of the Stanford Internet Observatory doing its research, whatever it is. Like, it, it's not illegal. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I, I personally wouldn't want to engage in my time with it, but it's it's their right to do that. And absolutely, Stanford ought to have a position where faculty have that right to, to do that. Uh, the problem is that the government's funding of it was more than just simply funding. I'll, I'll get to John in a second. Uh, the government funding was more than just funding. What, what happened was that the government would fund it, and then they would use the government, the, the, the Internet Observatory would use its government connections to be introduced to social media companies. That would they would like use essentially that angle to say, uh, look, uh, the government, you know, effectively the government is like sort of rubber stamping uh, this hit list by funding it. It's a question of the, the social use of it, and it is a very subtle and difficult thing. I, so, for instance, I think if if a professor wants to engage in this, absolutely, no problem. I mean, I, I, I in fact, not only there's no problem, I would be fully one hundred percent in favor of, against Stanford's, you know, clamping down on. It. If, if the government is funding it for the purpose of doing censorship it can't otherwise do, then Stanford essentially is a patsy for that. Uh, there needs to be some, they, they, and I don't know if it's necessarily Stanford's position to try to fix that, but, but the government ought not be engaged in those kinds of behaviors. So for instance, one way to fix this is the government just says, we're not gonna fund this kind of misinformation research. If you're gonna get it funded, go through it funded somewhere else. And that automatically means the social imprimatur of the government says this is bad information is gone from this. You just have to like defend it, your findings just in the academic space on your own, which is the position of most professors and most things. Um, yeah, so Jay, I, I, I agree with all of that. And, and I think it, the government is at fault. What the government was doing was absolutely wrong. Um, I, I have, but if, for example, we discover that uh, the government funding was funding them to be patsies. Is that something that uh, is objectionable? I mean, it's objectionable in some sense, but should it be allowed by the university? I mean, it's, I was thinking about about like historical examples like this, John. Um, so, like the, the one that I came to mind was like there must have been in the seventies a huge uproar over Stanford cooperating with the Departments of Defense during the Vietnam War. Right, there was. And how did we manage that? Like that must that's that's the, that's that's this problem on steroids. Right? Well, what's, the job, what's the difference between this and any conflict of interest? Stanford has this very extensive conflict of interest policy of people funding research. What's the difference between this and that? Well, so what is the conflict of interest? I mean, so if if they were dictating the results, that's a problem. But if they're simply saying, "Look, you guys want to do this. You want to. You want to act as, um, you know, 
some sort of. Uh, what did the judge find? What was the actual? What, what did he find? What he found was that the censorship went all in one direction against conservatives. What is getting you know, the my, my, yeah. my slight pushback to John is that funding, government funding for intensely political projects is very worrisome, and there's a lot of it on campus now. Uh, and I think that it's it's not just oh go investigate misinformation. It's go go advance a particular political project. And and we do there's many things that are funded by the government on this campus in order to defend the government's policies on X. And uh, that is something that I think is is not just yeah, I think, I think accepting that's, money for research. If the problem is more personnel, then like we know conservatives are very, very underrepresented on campus or in academics just generally, right? So like you're gonna automatically I, I mean I think the principle of academic freedom I want to support that independent of the substance of what people are doing inside of this. I think that's more important to me than substance. Um, and so uh, I, I, I just I can't come out in favor of getting, getting rid of the interest. That just I mean these are professors or people that want to study. Fine, they can they can study. It. Well, like um, the, taking money to, so from a larger social perspective, that the government is funding uh, um, academic institutions with taxpayer money. In order to come up with partisan political that, support that is where for a particular party, that, that, that is that's whether it's from the government or from the university, there is a rottenness to that. Yeah, so I I think that given the state of this sort of misinformation science field, uh, it is uh, it is very clearly partisan. Its social purpose is to, is for censorship, right? It's not actually identified in a disinterested way misinformation. It's it's to, it's to censor views that are opposed to what the government wants, what governments want. And so given that that's the social purpose, I don't think the government ought to be funding that activity. If someone wants to engage in it, fine, but that's not that's not my business. The, the, the key thing to me here is the, is the government involvement. Essentially, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's, 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 it's like laundering defamation at scale, right? The government involvement in this, you have, you have an entity that, that identifies a hit list for censorship. These people are the bad guys, the disinformation dozen or whatever. Um, and I mean, that's essentially a defamatory statement. Uh, it, you know, people who, who are defamed, they'll say this is not true. This, we're not, we're, we're trying to say, I mean, I don't agree with a lot of what those folks say, but like that, that's, that's neither here nor there. They, they have some argument. Um, and uh, those people, you know, it's one thing of a private entity defames them. It's another thing if, if the government defames them, Government funds the effort that ends up defaming them. That launders the defamation. Uh, I'm sorry, I came oh, hey, very late nice and to uh, good to be here. Uh, uh, so I'm sorry if this has already been covered, but I, I don't see why you're not willing to be as equally critical of Stanford as the government. I think it's very clear that Stanford Internet Observatory and the Vir Virality Project were created for the point of censorship and for the point of uh, partisan censorship. And they talk about this being research is a smokescreen. It's a fake smokescreen to try to justify this as a Stanford activity when it's very clearly basically an institute that's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's purpose is censorship, which should be the opposite of anything Stanford supports. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not, so I, I'm sympathetic to that view, Jeff, but I have to say, like, I, if I can think, of, I can think of an alternate world where that activity is not funded by the government, has no connection with the government, just people want to see what themes are developing on the internet. Um, fine, I, I don't think it's a particularly interesting research agenda, but fine, whatever. Well, then, then is a question: Should Stanford, as a totally private institution, be engaged in such parts okay. of the public life? But, but that and is an alternate Jeff world. Saying, no, so that, 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 well, that, that, that's not. Wait, wait, wait. John, it's, it's not Stanford that is engaged in that partisan uh, behavior. It's the Internet Observatory. And I mean, suppose, look, this is not the government, but let's take another example. We have we have a lot of student groups, uh, faculty who are funded by organizations that are supportive of Hamas. And they're only funded because they know Hamas, I mean, the, these organizations know that the, the, these are people who will speak in our favor. They will speak for us. There's also organizations that fund uh, Jewish, uh, you know, counter views, students and, and faculty who have um, uh, 
are on the side of, of Israel. And they only fund those people and those organizations because they know what they're going to say, that they're going to be supportive. Um, now, is that is that okay? I think it is. We have to let that happen, right? No, and you're exactly, I mean, Hoover itself was brought up in the fact that he said it because we're an evil right-wing organization and need to be kicked off. I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, but so I, I, go, I, I want to go to the conflict of interest because it does seem like there's a conflict of interest. Yeah. The we, we, you know, if you read the Federalist Papers, they, they were very worried about the awesome power of government, right? Standard. And so it, when, when, they, when, they, when the government funds and then simultaneously uses its awesome power to get the funder to uh, then go to the if Facebook and say, look, well, these are bad people. Oh, by the way, the government's on our side. That's a public interest. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it gives these groups undue power, undue power that they would not normally have just simply yeah. because they are a Stanford employee. I mean, the, the Stanford name actually drives you a lot. It's that's fine. Mind. It's part of being Stanford. Yeah, but but that you know exactly. So I, I, I think the question then is like, as a private entity, what Stanford? What is what is Stanford's aim? Right. I I I've been here thirty seven years, and I probably shouldn't speak for what Stanford's aim ought to be, but I have very strong opinions about this. Like I think Stanford's aim ought to be a place where these kinds of debates and discussions can happen without undue influence. Uh, without, 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 like, without sort of, it should be, a, it should not be a hostile work environment for the, the kinds of ideas that I was talking about during the pandemic. Um, it, it should be, in fact, more than just not a hostile work environment. It should, like, it, it should be a, it should be a place where these kinds of, the, the, like, discussions that are, like, at the heart of public discussion as our, 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 our panel. Um, oh, John. But just, so, uh, beyond the standard question, you brought up the effect of this as being legal, that people can now sue. But I, I sort of want to cheer you that the discovery itself is, I think, 90% of the beneficial effect, both for the federal government. There is a political response. I hope that in our next election, some candidates are going to say, hey, look at the awful things that the administration is doing, and that voters will be unhappy. And even for Stanford. Maybe the right answer for the Internet Observatory is not some policy from the top, but some, you know, you, this is now exposed, what Stanford is doing. Hopefully there's some alumni and trustees and faculty who are very unhappy about it. The discovery itself and the letting the world know what's happening is tremendously beneficial. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think it's a complicated thing. There's a lot of stakeholders in a university. Uh, our mission is let the winds of freedom blow. Yeah. Like that, yeah. Like whatever, whatever. That's the uh, canon. The, you mentioned this policy of where the government encouraged others to um, give evidence of bad, of disinformation. Now that reminds me of the Stasi uh, part, uh, aspect of East Germany. Now, last spring at the Stanford Senate, there was discussion of the Stasi-like system that is in place at Stanford. Um, basically, if somebody, if you, I say something that people don't like, and then it's um, reported to Stanford, um, and I'm never allowed to know who did this, um, then they can, uh, there's these rules. By the way, if you read the Stanford uh, uh, laws, it basically says that uh, there are no rules. It's just anything that we feel you, is bad, we're going to punish you. And, and then... Um, but then the thing is, there's enormous flexibility in there. I had a case where um, a, this is regarding climate change, which is very politicized also. And a Stanford professor sent me an email, which was vicious and nasty in many ways. Um, and a Stanford lawyer said to me, well, you know, if you post it, you'll, he'll probably sue you. And then she really reassured me by saying, yeah, he'll probably lose, but oh yeah, that that's really reassuring that he's going to sue me, but then um, uh, I lose. And then, but then I also asked high level Stanford officials about this email. No one said that it was violated the Stanford speech code. No one's, even though, you know, well, I mean, look at it. It's, it's, it's it, interesting, but the fundamental standard, standard at Stanford applies to students, but not to faculty. Right, we we are. Oh no 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 no! Don't don't get me on on this, okay? But but I, I just I, 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 I have to, I have facts that I cannot talk about with the cameras on. Okay, so I just want I just want to say like I I can't uh, I don't 
I, there's no way to resolve all the tensions of this university. There's, I, John, I have no idea how you did your job for that many years so gracefully, because it's it's just like, there's very, very complicated questions and difficult things in, in the university, like intentions, when people, when, whenever people disagree. I think part of that is, is if you have a place that, that cherishes academic freedom, you're automatically going to have a lot of these like conflicts. That's just part and parcel of it. And so having a place that allows that to happen gracefully is part of our mission. I, I think we failed at that during the pandemic, but that's, uh, but that, you know, and I think we can, there, there are ways to try to fix that. Uh, my view on, on this, I, I've focused on the government mainly because I think that I, the, the government has played a tremendously malign role in this, uh, in this, the debate over COVID and also in social media. And also I think it's, it's, it's poisoned and made the job of universities that are committed after freedom more difficult. Um, and I think, uh, so like my view, so I've been, I've been working on an op-ed on this, uh, about what to do about this, you know, the, per, the permitted under the Fifth Circuit. I think, uh, a lot of this is a lot of the, these activities are funded by government agencies, right? The, 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 the uh, State Department funds it, the, the NSF funds it, the NIH funds it. They have these like vast research infrastructures, huge amounts of money to, to, to fund this, where, where the goal, and there's some benign goals and there's some, some I think, malign goals. I, I think the right thing is for the government to just stop funding this altogether. This meaning the development of hidden for social media censorship, the development of, of here's what we think misinformation is. I think it's it's not an appropriate use of money by the NIH to say who is spreading misinformation online. Right? That's a that's a federal decision. And there's also the question of should Stanford say the federal government was going to do that anyway, should Stanford accept the money? I have trouble with people telling Stanford faculty that they can't accept the money for this. For but we do, but there's a conference of interest. Yeah, but the limits on government power are much more important here than the limits on what potentially competitive but, I, think, I, I think a lot you of can set up, You can set up I a right wing. Yeah, yeah, but you can set up a right I, wing. I am with you, Jay, that you're saying you have trouble with Stanford telling an individual researcher what you can or cannot do. But we're talking about institutes that were set up by Stanford and you know, see, hired I, with the sole purpose. Yeah, that is, that is, I, I think I think they dry up if the State Department doesn't fund those kind of activities. If the NSF doesn't fund those kind of activities, I think I think that those kinds of activities only exist because the government is funding those activities. Don't you think they, they could find left wing donors to fund those? They could, but it wouldn't have the same kind of in, in, inside. Yeah, well, uh, the complex the complex. The, well, back to where there's the implicit the government's pushing. And yes. The government might. And maybe one standard is if you don't think the NSA should legally be allowed to do this, then why in the world is the government allowed to pay somebody else to do this? Exactly. That is pretty clear. The NSA should not be doing this. That's the point. The judge found the government used the organization to do stuff it could not do itself. Right. That's the conflict. But it's using Stanford. That's why I say is yeah. Stanford is a patsy, right? What yeah. it's doing is it's it's there's nothing. I think if some left wing donor wants to do this, fine. I don't really yeah, care, right? Yeah. It's yeah. the it's the it's the implicit government imprimatur that allows it to be used for something that's really socially undesirable. Yeah. So, so, so you guys are going to the Supreme Court, so yeah, this very well made. But I, I but I think I think that it's Supreme Court can end up where John is actually. John Ashmeni is like he. Uh, they're going to end up with where the Fifth Circuit is, right? They're going to they're going to say there's no way you can you can lean on social media companies to censor, and they're going to say it's fine to fund to fund. It's fine to fund things that you cannot do. To yes, I think that's what I think that's where they're going to end, end up. This but spring. Congress can enter this through the budgeting process and just say, look, NIH, you're not allowed to fund this. NSF, you're not allowed to fund this. State Department, you're not allowed to fund this. We want to cut the line, the line items that say you're doing this. We'll put a provision on the front. It hasn't really been that effective at stopping it. Yeah. They said you're not allowed to do so. This will be two real strategies. I presume that the policy of Stanford is you are not allowed to take funds from a funding agency where they are explicit, they want a result. Is that true? I presume it's true. Jonathan? So that is basically what Stanford's policy is. You cannot. You can we cannot accept a fund you know funding from any agency any any uh, uh, individual that dictates the results or that has for example 
prior constraints on publication. So we could not take a grant that said, um, you know, here, here you do this internet observatory, and by the way, here is what we want you to find, or here are the people that we want on your list. We could not take that. The university technically could not take that. Does the government nonetheless have the ability to choose, pick and choose who they fund? Well, of course they do. I mean, that's what's happening all the time in climate research. It's happening all the time now in public health research. Um, and, and that's quite upsetting, but it's different from dictating the results. But, but if they, what's this been dictating the results and saying, as the government, we can't make a list, so we want you to make a list. Well, you know, it's hard for me to answer that. If, if they don't dictate who's on the list, you know, if you, if you have the freedom to put um, Anthony Fauci on that list, then, uh, yeah, that I think that's funding. Yeah, well, it's, it's not explicit, Jonathan, you know, you start a center saying, I'm going to have the center for uh, the, the Center for Finding Right-Wing Extremist Hate Speech, and then the government says, oh, I think I'll fund that one. But you can do whatever you want. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think there's like two things here, right? So there's, there's two actors here. There's, there's the government of Stanford, right? So, so Stan if the government is using Stanford as a patsy, that's on the government, I think. And the right remedy is on the government side, not not necessarily. I don't know what Stanford could do consistent with. I mean, I think that that policy, John, you said is I agree with that policy, and I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with a, a step more than that because the, the, th the thing is, the government should should be using taxis to do what it can't otherwise do. That's that's the problem. I I believe. I agree. Now, now, now Stanford, uh, from a business point of view, does it really want to be just Funding, you know, left-wing causes in in his research—that's a different. That is, that's a different question. I think that's unwise from a policy point of view for Stanford. Um, but that's that, in, in a sense, is like uh, less important to me than the government not being able to to do what it's been doing. That's, I mean, this. I think everyone should agree. At least the first, the second step of this two step should not happen. If the government were to stop leading on social media companies. Do you think that the second part of the problem is uh, economically important? I looked at what the observatory is doing. They're not super successful. They seem to have close to zero impact on social media outside of Stanford. Maybe they have some impact inside it. Well, the, 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 the influence that they have actually is by their connection to the social media companies themselves. Like before Elon took over Twitter, they were they're all over the Twitter database with, with and where, where they're like, you know, sending them, you know, here are the, here are the misinformers, here are the people you should de-boost, here are the, the, here are the ideas that are spreading on your platform, this misinformation with, you know, again, with the implicit and premature government behind them. And then the social media companies have these like employees in their press and safety decision that would just say, okay, yeah, we'll just do it. Yeah. Um, everybody likes to talk about left wing. Um, problems. The conservatives also are quite willing to use the same. Yes, yes. I agree with that. I mean, I, I, th I think this is a, this is a this is an enormous problem. I mean, we're saying left wing because the, this university is large, uh, is populated largely left wing folks. But you are, I, from, as a principal thing, I think the key thing is not left or right wing. The principal thing is, can the can, should the government be using these kinds of third parties in a way? to allow them to, to evade uh, restrictions that without, they otherwise would have. And I just, I think that that's, I mean, that's a constructive thing. Everyone left or right should agree the government should not be able to do that. Jay, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. David Henderson here, just real quick, since I know time's winding down, is there anything specific beyond what this discussion that you wanted from us? You, you guys have been, I have to say, uh, you know, just as a sorry, personal note, the fact that you guys exist and have been like, open to give me forums and like kind to me, you have no idea what, Dan, I think I've told you this personally, you have no idea what that's meant to me. Yes, so okay. It's allowed me to keep going actually. Okay, um, so, so, I'm really okay. so we're giving you what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but you also give me like lots of, lots of like, lots of things to think about. So it, Okay, you know, good, it, thanks. It's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're going to have a different quote. We're going to be in the fact, we need to use it in the fact that we said it, which is my view is as a conflict of interest. The government, for the sole purpose, 
They choose it. They can find whoever they want. But if they're funded to get around the fact that they are, that, to do something they couldn't otherwise do, if that's the reason they're funded, then that's a conflict of interest. And then at Stanford, we shouldn't, our conflict of interest policy is we can't accept it. So yeah. if the government is intending to use the institute to do something that it itself can't do, that's a conflict of interest and should not be allowed to understand the that, that, That's an interesting, that's an interesting idea. I guess the question is, how does Stanford determine that? Okay, that's a separate issue. Yeah, but it, 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 that is interesting. Like if, it's, if it's if the government, how does the Stanford government determine if, if, they, if they're going to only fund research with a particular outcome? Maybe they just like go ahead and fund it, yeah. right? But then surreptitiously do things to for, to uh, then you know it's a, sometimes it's hard to yeah. see the conflict. I think I think you're missing half the point of that argument, though, because you're it's not research. The the, the research is a phony argument. That, that, yeah, that's that's what, opinion. Opinion. what SIU is doing, that's my opinion, what SIU is doing is not research. They're part of a censorship group. The reason they exist is for censorship. The Their sole purpose is for censorship. They recruited people for the censorship mission. They're it not doing information. anything that's meaningful research. Uh, you can call it my opinion, but look at, look at what they produce. Uh, uh, they're, okay, they're, they're, they're not doing research. They're an activism group. They're a political activist group at Stanford, and they were put together for that purpose, and that's the action they're doing. Okay. And, and, and trying to pretend their research is actually buying into their fake argument. But Jeff, well, I want to differentiate between the academic freedom to, to do whatever you want to say, and that's what I, I, I want to protect them on that. And I know you may not agree with them on everything else, I want to have a rule that says people get to do what they want, get to see what they want. Uh, but I don't no, want. No, no, no. <laughs> I disagree with that. Uh, very strongly think individuals should do what they want. We don't make institutes at Stanford that are political activist groups that where that is their sole purpose. We, I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about institutes at Stanford. We don't well, have. Jeff, Jeff, you know one thing that. We're, what you're saying is unrealistic. Stanford doesn't create institutes in, at that level. Stanford did not create the Stanford Internet Observatory. In fact, the, the president provost uh, didn't even know it existed. Uh, it, it was created within FSI, the Freeman Spokely Institute, by faculty. I mean, you can you could start an institute. We could start. Let's let's start an institute for whatever. Um, uh, Classical liberalism. And and that would be us doing that. We could put a plaque up that says the Institute for Classical Liberalism. And Stanford would not even know about it. They wouldn't have any say in it. So it's hard to distinguish. Jeff, you, you want to say that Stanford did this. And no, Stanford people did this. People at Stanford but, did this. I, I, I want to challenge you there, John. I, I can believe our new president, who is only interim president and hasn't been president for a long time, did not know about this. Uh, this was initially created at Freeman Spogli, but it was sponsored, I think partially funded, by the law school. And it seems very, <laughs> it, 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 it either seems incredibly blind or uh, hard to believe that the dean of the law school did not know about an institute in the law school. You know, I, I, I think okay, there's- Jeff, Jeff, just to, to be clear, so we have FSI, and then FSI has, uh, what is it? The uh, There's a there's an organization, a part of FSI that's called, well, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, and then within that, they have projects. And one of the projects that got started was the Internet Observatory. Now, is it hard to believe that the dean of the law school didn't know about that project? I find it quite easy to believe. No, but the, the law school specifically sponsored the Internet Observatory and, and the Virality Project. Am I wrong on that? I don't know. I, 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 I think the law school, they weren't sponsoring FSI. They were sponsoring the Internet Observatory. So are you against a Nazis? Blatantly political, blatantly one-sided. You're against that, and that's ability to start whatever the fuck she's got. She's doing. 
Um, no, obviously not. Same thing here. We, I'm against the federal government using it to do things the federal government can't do. I mean, and I, us being I, part of it. Like I, I think... I, I, a Knox Institute, you know, uh, is an intellectual institute. Very, very... You know, oh, really? Yeah, yes. I mean, it, 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 there's no intellectual institute in that. It, no it, alternative it, thought is, is considered. It's only one-sided. No, you try to without argue that not on anything other than the world is bad and forget it. Okay, you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay.